Good evening there, everybody. What is happening? Hopefully, you all are having a wonderful day today. You know, I thought that I would do this little NBA conversation. And the reason why I thought that I would do this NBA conversation is because I thought that this particular conversation was very particularly interesting. And NBA, of course, is not a sport that I end up talking about quite as much as some of the others that I may on my channel. But the NBA, National Basketball Association, of course, at a professional basketball, it still is one of my favorite sports to watch. I believe that it is a very highly skilled league. I believe that you have a great amount of players from all over the world, not even just that from the U.S. You have Mr. Joel Embiid, who I believe is from Cameroon, Africa, of course. I believe he's from there anyway. If I'm incorrect, someone correct me. You have Nikola Jokic, who I believe is from that of Serbia. You have Luka Doncic, who is from Slovenia. And there may be even a couple of other players that I'm not personally thinking of right now. Giannis Antetokounmpo, of course, from that of Greece. The league right now, in my opinion, you could debate, is as talented as what it has ever been. And I think that the NBA has pretty much been overall the recipient of top-notch talent pretty much ever since, especially, well, one could even argue all the way back from the 60s onwards. But I think all in all, that the league today is just very, very exciting to watch. And one of my favorite players overall to watch throughout the 2010s, and I grew up throughout the 2010s, I'm 24 years old right now at the current moment in time, I grew up watching athletes like that of a Tom Brady, I grew up watching athletes like that of a Peyton Manning, a Stephen Curry, a LeBron James, a Kevin Durant, a Kawhi Leonard, Novak Djokovic, Roger Federer, a little bit of Mayweather, a little bit of Pacquiao, and now Canelo Alvarez, I've overall seen a great amount of the athletes of the 2010s and one of the most impactful and influential athletes of the 2010s in my opinion was number 30 Mr. Stephen Curry for that of the Golden State Warriors and I think that his story is very very particularly interesting especially now that he has won his fourth NBA championship and finally won a finals MVP and in my opinion you could argue that he has deserved more finals MVPs but the biggest question about Mr. Stephen Curry is, at the current moment in time, with what he has accomplished, is he a lock for a top 10 player? Or is he a top 10 player? And in this particular video, when it comes down to it, and I've already kind of talked about that and explained my opinion, but in this video, Mr. Kendrick Perkins, who of course used to be a former NBA player, not only is he actually going to debate that Stephen Curry is a top 10 NBA player of all time, but that Stephen Curry, at least on his list, and I'm not really sure if he 100% truly believes this because I don't think that he has much argument for it. <laughs> but he's going to debate actually that Stephen Curry is actually on his Mount Rushmore. That's overall what he's going to debate. Do I agree with that? No, I do not. Absolutely not. And it's no offense against Stephen Curry. I think that Stephen Curry is an all-time great player. Not even just a great player. Not even just a greatly skilled player. He is an all-time great player. And if he decided to retire today... He would have a serious debate, at least for a lock in the top 15, in my opinion. And right now, he certainly is banging on the door, if not already within the top 10. But anyways, Mr. Kendrick Perkins and I believe Mad Dog Russo and Molly Karam, they're going to be having a discussion about it. I thought that this not only would be a very interesting conversation for me to talk about Mr. Stephen Curry overall and his legacy, but also to compare him to two of the most comparable athletes probably of the past 20 plus years within the sport of basketball, one being Mr. LeBron James and another one, of course, being Mr. Kobe Bryant, who, of course, is unfortunately no longer with us. But I'm going to be saying overall what I believe all three players bring to the table, in my opinion, when it comes down to it. And I'm going to be stating who I would rather have on my team with the three and who, in my opinion, is the greatest from first, second to third. And I'm going to be explaining overall in this video. But anyways, Mr. Kendrick Perkins and Mandel Grusso, they're going to be talking. And I'm going to tune in. Let's get into this conversation. On the Point Forward podcast, I think he's got a number of years to go. And I think hopefully we're going to be better next year. These young guys will be better. Steph still got it. I don't see him going off a cliff. Sorry to the rest of the league. I don't see him getting any worse. This guy is well-conditioned. It is unbelievable. Kendrick uh, Stephen Curry is very well conditioned and Stephen Curry especially a lot out of a lot of basketball players his conditioning and the way that he can run around the court and you know overall shoot off the screens and set up screens and 
constantly overall, you know, just gravitate the defense towards him. He's really always moving off the ball, and that is a big part of the reason why Stephen Curry is so great as a basketball player, or it's a part of the reason. And you know what? That is actually something that not every single player can do. When you take a look at a lot of these players, for example, that end up getting a lot of these stat pads or end up getting a lot of these statistics, especially when they lead in every single category, certain people just don't get it. They'll take a look at Russell Westbrook. They'll take a look at Luka Doncic, or they'll take a look at James Harden, or especially LeBron James. LeBron James is always lauded in the media because he's able to lead in almost every statistical category. When you play a team game, especially in that of NBA basketball, you're not supposed to be leading in every statistical category. Now, if you end up doing that, and overall that is a cohesive fit to, you know, to win the game, then kudos to you. But oftentimes, there is a reason why LeBron James has often, in my view, I'm not going to say that more oftentimes than not, he's underwhelmed. But in my view, if LeBron James was as great as what the media overall tried to allege as what he is, he would have a few more championships than what he has now. I don't think that there's any problem with losing a couple of finals appearances, you know, maybe even having a negative record. But LeBron James has had so much help and so much talent throughout his career to work with, especially from the 2010 to 2011 season onward. Every season, pretty much from then, he has had a very, very decent team to work with. And there's been a couple of years where he did very, very well, of course, with them when it came down to, to where he even won the championship. But oftentimes, more than not, in my view, his seasons were a little bit more disappointing in terms of leading a team to an NBA championship. Uh, because LeBron James, A, does not play off the ball very, very well. And B, he plays in a very ball-dominant system. Uh, and basically, LeBron James, you know, he gets into this tandem where he says, oh, well, what am I supposed to do? I don't have the help. I'm leading in every statistical category when it comes down to it. And all in all, I've never had an elite coach and all sorts of stuff. But kind of similar to like that of an Aaron Rodgers when it comes down to it in that of NFL football, LeBron James always claims that he does not have enough help. But when you actually take a look at the amount of talent that he has had to work with, the amount of talent that he usually has had to work with, it certainly has been better than that of the average NBA player. And LeBron James has had to work with a multitude of Hall of Famers. He's had to work with Dwayne Wade. He's had the pleasure of working with Chris Bosh, even Ray Allen when he was a little bit more downhill. You know, and that's not even bringing up some of the good role players like Mario Chalmers and maybe a couple of other players that I'm personally forgetting at the moment. When you were back with Cleveland, you had Kevin Love, who was a five-time All-Star, someone overall who was a very decent rebound, a re very decent rebounder, excuse me, not the worst shooter when it came down to it, and he was only your third option. And then on top of that, you had Kyrie Irving. Now, Kyrie Irving as a leader, in my opinion, is very, very limited. But as an all-around greatly skilled player, and especially as a second guy, or a second option, a second option, excuse me, and as a great sidekick, he is a great player. And he really helped out LeBron James win that 2016 NBA Finals Series. And then on top of that, after that, you got to work with Anthony Davis, and you got to work with Russell Westbrook. Now, Westbrook, I'll give you a little bit of a pass for, because we all know that Westbrook, he's very, very difficult to deal with. And when he plays off the ball, not only overall is he not good, he's absolutely horrendous. So it just is what it is. But what I will say is this. LeBron James, a lot of the times, the media always tries to tell you that, oh, he makes everyone better around him. But then at the same time, they always say that he never has enough help. Well, how can you certain times, at certain times, have a multitude of Hall of Famers on your team or have a multitude of All-Stars on your team and on top of that, a bunch of role players? But apparently, you know, you make everyone around you better, but yet your team's always underperform. That does not make any sense. Even Stephen Curry, who now has the same amount of championships, as a LeBron James, he's 4-2 and two in the NBA Finals with four wins and two losses. Stephen Curry is the true definition of a player who actually makes every player around him better. LeBron James usually does not actually make the players around him better. He will make your all-around team better because of what he can bring to the team individually. But in terms of overall making teammates actually better, no, he does not usually do that. And if you take a look at the evidence and the statistics of most players that he ends up playing with, their stats usually end up going down, sometimes even their proficiency. Besides Dwayne Wade, a lot of his teammates, when it came down to it, they actually underperformed on his team. And then when they went on another team to where they actually had a cohesive role, they actually usually did a little bit better. Whether it was Isaiah Thomas, whether it was overall Jay Crowder, whether overall it was Derrick Rose, whether overall it was, you know, some other teammates when it came down to it. 
LeBron James, at the end of the day, he plays two ball dominant and he does not move off the ball very, very well. That is something that Stephen Curry, in my view, actually has an advantage over LeBron James over. Now, is that me stating that Stephen Curry is above LeBron James on my all-time great list? No, uh, because I think LeBron James, not only does he have him beat him in, you know, finals MVPs and MVPs, they have the same amount of championships. And even with the system that LeBron James plays, you can debate that he was the most dominant player throughout the 2010s. You could certainly debate that. Uh, and Stephen Curry uh, and Kevin Durant, they did make, you know, probably the best duo in the NBA for about a good three years. But what I will say is this, if Stephen Curry were able to win one more NBA championship and one more finals MVP, in my opinion, he would be right there with LeBron James and Tim Duncan and Larry Bird. Because in my opinion, all three of those players, they're in the same category. And as for Kobe Bryant, we'll get to him a little bit later. But anyway. Yes. Tell me this, sir. Uh, where does Steph Curry rank on the all-time list right now? He ranks number four. Um, and he's on my... <laughs> well, no, Perk. I can't necessarily agree with you on that one. Uh, and to be quite honest with you, I kind of have to wonder why Kendrick Perkins is starting to rank Stephen Curry so highly. Because he was a person, he was an analyst that actually the majority of the time he would more trash Stephen Curry over than what he would give him praise. And when you see someone all in all that used to trash someone so much and then all of a sudden they give them praise out of nowhere, it's usually because they have a certain machination or it's usually overall because they have a certain narrative in play. And if I had to guess overall what it was, more than likely is to try to boost his boy LeBron James because Kendrick Perkins, he's a big fan of two players who are ball dominant players in the NBA, one being Russell Westbrook and also another one being Mr. LeBron James. And for those of you that don't know, Kendrick Perkins, I believe his last year in the league, he was overall on that team that made it to the finals with LeBron James. LeBron James has a lot of guys in the media that defend him and stand up for him and will debate that he is the greatest of all time over Michael Jordan, over any of these players. You know, they basically love to spread all these good, all this good shit about him. All right. And I think that LeBron James kind of does that intentionally, but it is what it is anyway. Rushmore right now, Molly. But the reason overall why maybe it would be positive for LeBron James to rank Stephen Curry in the top four is because if you were going to debate LeBron James as the greatest of all time, which would not shock me if Kendrick Perkins were trying to do that whatsoever. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Kendrick Perkins has already stated that he believes Michael Jordan is greater than LeBron James. I don't think I've seen that, but I could be wrong. But if I had to guess, at least just off of the knowledge that I know, more than likely he is doing this. So in the future, if people overall say, well, you know, LeBron James, look at the players that he had to get through. He had to get through Stephen Curry, who's on my Mount Rushmore. And on top of that, that team and Kevin Durant. What did you really expect from those teams? Even though LeBron James, in my opinion, in 2017, had a pretty even Stephen chance of debatably winning that final series, or at least should have made it a hell of a lot more competitive than what it actually was. And what you notice about LeBron James is that when he plays a very highly intelligent and cohesive unit in the NBA Finals, even when he does have a great amount of talent, the series is usually not as close as what is what it should be. Uh, he ends up getting swept in 2018. Uh, you can give him maybe a little bit of a break there because he really did not have a second A-plus player or a you know great player there, debatably. Maybe Kevin Love if you wanted to say that. But he also did have a great amount of role players. My point being is this. LeBron James should have been able to win, win at least one or two games in that series, and they were not able to do anything. They almost won game one because the Golden State Warriors did not take them seriously. But other than that, the games were not even close. In 2017, the Golden State Warriors pretty much whooped their ass overall throughout that whole entire series. So it is what it is. And 2014 happened as well. And 2011, I do not give LeBron James a break for those years. All right. So it is what it is. Right now, he's on Mount Rushmore. Again, I have to come on here time and time again and repeat myself about being a generational talent. Okay, we know Michael Jordan is on Mount Rushmore. We know that LeBron James is on Mount Rushmore. And look, you can pick whoever you want at number three, whether it's Wilt, Kareem, Magic, Bird, or whoever. But at number four, it's Steph Curry. Uh, no, no, he's not. That's not fair. Uh, he's a guard, and he's a wonderful player, and he's somewhere between 10 and 15. Whoa. He's not top four. I mean... It... 
<laughs> and you heard Molly in the background say, whoa, basically like shots fired. Well, there's really no shots about it. I don't think that there's anything to really get up in arms about. And I like Stephen Curry. He's actually one of my more favorite players to watch uh, throughout this generation. He might be my favorite all-around player to watch throughout the 2010s. But no, uh, he is not a top four player of all time. Uh, and it's really not that particularly close, at least at the current moment in time. Don't get me wrong. If we were to maybe argue about how impactful Stephen Curry has been in terms of an offensive impact, if you just want to argue, you know, changing the game and, you know, pretty much, you know, somewhat changing how the league plays. You may even have a debate that Stephen Curry is the most offensively impactful player of all time if you really wanted to put him there. But impact overall, at least from that standpoint, is a little bit different than the whole entire package in terms of grading a player on their greatness. And I agree with Mr. Mad Dog Russo. I would rate Stephen Curry somewhere along that 10 to 15 range. Right now, to me, he's anywhere from 12 to 10. And that means that, in my view, that he's in that same bracket as Akeem Olajuwon and Kobe Bryant. Because those two players, in my opinion, they're right there neck and neck. So, it is what it is. Anyway. The Jordan, LeBron, Kareem, <sighs> Will, Russell. Duncan, Bird, Magic, Kobe. All right, I ask you right now, Kendrick, I'll ask you. You played forever. You're, you're, the, you're, the, you're the star, not me. I ask you right now, you can start a season tomorrow. You want Kobe, uh, what, nine-time all-defense? What do you want Curry in your backcourt? You take one or the other. Which one are you taking? I'm taking Curry. Over Kobe? Can't do that. Are you coming? Uh, well, I can. Uh, and, and a lot of people are not going to agree with that. Uh, Kobe was an all-time great player. Uh, but in my opinion, in certain conversations, he's been a little bit more overrated than what he has been underrated. Uh, and this is not me to trash Kobe. There's a certain amount of people that would debate that he is not even a debatable top 10 player. I disagree with that. I think that if you were to put Kobe in the top 10, I wouldn't have him any higher than number 10 or number 9. Uh, but all in all, I do think that you could debate it. Uh, Kobe still was one of the greatest shooting guards and one of the greatest players of all time. He still was an exceptional talent. But what brings Kobe down, in my opinion, is that he was not as proficient or efficient as what he could have been. Not only that, but Kobe Bryant, from what we've heard from, from a multitude of sources, was a hellhound to work with. Uh, Kobe Bryant, all in all, in my view, uh, he probably was not as impactful or valuable as what a prime and peak Stephen Curry was. And I know a lot of people, they're not going to agree with that. But it just is what it is. If we talk about value, Stephen Curry is probably one of the top five most impactful players of all time. Uh, Kobe Bryant, in my opinion, is not one of the top five most impactful players of all time. It just is what it is. Uh, Stephen Curry, whenever he had a you know potential playoff worthy team, in my opinion, he pretty much showed out for the season. Whether that meant going to the finals or giving the San Antonio Spurs a very, very rough time or giving Lob City a very, very tough time when he was very inexperienced, or losing in the NBA Finals, or winning four NBA championships. Uh, let's understand that Stephen Curry, uh, overall, that his highest percentage shooting, I believe, in a season is 50%. He is one of the players, one of the few players in NBA history, that is a part of the 50-40-90 club. Kobe Bryant, for his seasons, even going to the end of the 2000s, uh, when it came down to it, even if you were going to argue that that was a very, very hard-nosed defense era. Uh, Kobe Bryant never even shot above 47% for his career. Actually, he never even shot 47% for his career. Uh, so it just is what it is. Kobe Bryant was a great player. But in terms of overall, you know, uh, picking Stephen Curry or Kobe Bryant, who would I personally take? Uh, and I know that the Kobe Bryant fans especially are not going to agree with me. And I've dealt with many, many Kobe Bryant and LeBron James fans and other fans. The Kobe Bryant fan base might be one of the craziest fan bases that I've ever personally seen overall, not even just in NBA history, but in sports history, period. Them and the Allen Iverson fan base. The Allen Iverson fan base is batshit insane as well. But when it comes down to it, don't get me wrong, that is not to disrespect Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant is an all-time great player. Uh, but overall, if I were to picking a guy to lead a team overall, and if I were to put them on the same squad and say, handle that, and overall, you know, basically try to, you know, make, make the best of the situation that you can. Am I picking Kobe Bryant or am I picking Stephen Curry? I'm going to pick Stephen Curry. I believe that all around that he has more gravitational pull. 
I believe that he's more efficient. I believe that he's more proficient when it comes down to it. I believe all in all that he's more valuable and I believe that he's more impactful. And you can say whatever the hell that you want to about how he had Clay Thompson and Draymond Green. Well, Kobe Bryant also had Shaquille O'Neal. He also overall, I believe, had many, many other talented players. Let's also not forget there was that one season where he had, I believe, Steve Nash and Dwight Howard and the team didn't do shit. So at the end of the day, this narrative that Kobe Bryant really didn't have the talent of a Steph or a LeBron James, that is not the case. Kobe Bryant has actually overall had a great amount of talent in his career. And there were also seasons as well where he did underperform. Okay. One thing I will say about Stephen Curry now, of course, his career has only been 13 years long as of yet, uh, you know, when it comes down to it. So far, whenever his team was looked at as possibly playoff caliber, not only did they always make the playoffs, which you cannot say about LeBron James and Mr. Kobe Bean Bryant, but on top of that, when it comes down to it, Stephen Curry usually has maxed out for that season, whether it was against the Clippers, you know, who were more experienced than them when it came down to it, or at least more talented than them probably at the time, you know, or he was ended, ended up winning the finals, you know, losing the finals. He's been there six times in one decade when it came down to or within a 10 year span, pretty much. So Stephen Curry is a very special player. And in my opinion, Stephen Curry and Kobe Bryant, they're in that same bracket. But if I were to pick a player, in my opinion, about who is more valuable and impactful, I'm picking Stephen Curry. Now, if you want to maybe bring up the defensive argument, you can do that all you want to. But I don't think that Stephen Curry really was anywhere near as bad of a defensive player. I don't think that he's anywhere near as bad of a defensive player as many people try to say that he is. In fact, I think that at times he can be a very decent defensive player. Uh, I would not call him Gary Payton or anything. I would not say on the note that, you know, he's necessarily a Kawhi Leonard or something like that. But you notice that Stephen Curry with his teams, not only are they always one of the most offensively impactful teams, they're also one of the most defensively impactful teams. And when you have a hole on defense, Overall, sometimes like what LeBron James was throughout the 2010s, your team is not going to be one of the best defensive teams throughout the years. It just is what it is. But every single year when the Golden State Warriors overall have the right weapons around them, you know, Stephen Curry overall leads them to not only being one of the most offensively impactful teams, but also one of the most defensively impactful teams. Okay, so why is that? Confident in that perk. Yeah, no, ser serious though. Yeah. Is that an easy? No. Is that an easy one for you to answer? But if we were just to debate Kobe Bryant and Stephen Curry at the current moment in time, and if you were to ask me straight out, you know, who do you think is the greater player? I personally would take Stephen Curry, and a lot of people would not agree with that. Listen, if you want to go with Kobe being Bryant, I really have no problem with that whatsoever. More defensive teams, I really don't have a problem with that. One more NBA championship, even though I would debate that on three of those NBA championships, Kobe Bryant really was not the definitive best player and it really was not even an argument and some people would say well you know look, look who's talking you know you talking about Stephen Curry you know on two of those championships that he won Kevin Durant was the best player well one could also argue that Stephen Curry took a step backward for Kevin Durant at times to be the best player for them to succeed kind of like how Magic Johnson did with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or the great point guards or other great you know players who maybe had to take a step back in order overall for their team to succeed in the best of ways. You know, and some people may not agree with that sentiment, but it just is what it is. But this also does need to be taken into account. Kobe Bryant, when it comes down to it, with those first three championships, it took him a very, very long time to win an NBA championship overall without a Shaq. And Shaq was already a player that led the Orlando Magic to a finals appearance before he was even there with Kobe Bryant. And he also was able to win a championship without a Dwayne Wade in the Miami Heat afterwards. So it's not like Kobe Bryant was the definitive best player of that squad. I would not even put Kobe Bryant, in my view, in terms of all time, I would not put him above Shaq. You know, I would not put him there, even though I think it's a little bit more debatable than what some people say. But in my opinion, Shaq is just decently more impactful and valuable. It just is what it is. Uh, when you take a look at Stephen Curry and Kevin Durant, you can make the argument all you want to that Kevin Durant got those finals MVPs. But this is still the facts at the end of the day. Kevin Durant has zero NBA championships without Stephen Curry. Okay, it just is what it is. He has zero NBA championships without Stephen Curry. Steph has two NBA championships now without that of Kevin Durant. So the people overall that say that Kevin Durant, that he's greater than Stephen Curry, no, I'm sorry, you're sorely mistaken. Is there certain areas where Kevin Durant is more talented than Stephen Curry? Sure, no doubt about it. But can he ever be greater than Stephen Curry unless he wins more NBA championships? especially without Stephen Curry? No, not in my view.
Like a no-brainer, you would just go it's curry? Not, it's, 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 it's not an easy one to answer. And let me let me explain, Molly. When, when I opened up on the topic, when you uh when you asked me, I didn't go long because yeah. I wanted to let Mad Dog outside for his bathroom break. And when he came back in, I had a doggy treat waiting for him. You know why? <laughs> because I wanted to hear, I wanted to, I, I wanted to hear his response. And now that I heard his response, let me dive into why I have Steph Curry on my, my Rushmore. Let me explain to you, okay? Forget all the accolades and forget how long that his, how, how long his resume uh, is. We know it's longer than the holiday weekend. Forget all that, okay? <laughs> Man, I love Kendrick Perkins' voice. This dude, this dude sounds like he's from Georgia or something. Man, man, this is the reason why I have Stephen Curry in my top four. <laughs> I love this dude. When I speak on being a generational talent, I'm talking about a 6'2 guard that has changed the game of basketball forever, okay? Forever. And so when I look at his history, when I look at what he's done since he got to Golden State, it's almost been like a plug and replace. When I look at his first championship that he won with Harrison Barnes at the wing position, okay, you win with Harrison Barnes, no problem. All of a sudden, you go 73-9, and nine, you lose to LeBron James, I get that. All of a sudden, you become still... I can't be because you play off the ball well. You're efficient. Steph Curry is efficient. I agree. Stephen Curry does play off the ball well, and that is something that not every player knows how to do. In fact, that's that's an area where a lot of players really don't know how to do well. That is something that LeBron James to this day still does not know how to do very well uh, because every system that LeBron James has ever played in, he's been usually in a ball-dominant type of system besides that of the Miami Heat. Uh, and even, you know, the first year, they were not that successful because LeBron James really did not show up because he didn't really know how to play off the ball that well. Uh, you know, and, and certain people may not know the difference uh, because certain people may take a look at LeBron James and they're just like, oh, my God, well, you know, he's greater than Michael Jordan and all these other guys because he leads in every single statistic on his team. Well, the reason why he does that is because LeBron James takes things into his own hands in almost every single thing. Uh, but then, But then at the end of the day, uh, apparently LeBron James then bitches and moans later on that, oh, well, I don't have enough help. Well, LeBron James, no matter who's he, who he has worked with, whether it be Dwayne Wade or Chris Bosh, he has always led the statistics in every single category. So <laughs> obviously, you know, someone is riding in Denmark about that situation. It is very clear that LeBron James would prefer to be in a system or prefer to overall be in a coaching line to where he still has the ball in his hands primarily 99% of the time overall than usually sacrifice his numbers or overall play in some other some other type of system because to this day he still has never tried to go with Greg Popovich he has never overall tried to go with one of these elite coaches in the NBA LeBron James overall believes and this is the same thing that I said about Aaron Rodgers almost very similarly just like how Aaron Rodgers has been bitching for years and years about how allegedly the Green Bay Packers don't give him enough help and it's a head coaching problem or it's the GM's problem. It's a, it's a head office problem. But then when Aaron Rodgers has an opportunity to leave the Green Bay Packers, what does he do? Uh, he overall signs the max contract overall, basically to where they probably cannot re-sign Devontae Adams when it comes down to it. And on top of that, they may not be able to resign certain players that they would need to. So what was Aaron Rodgers really telling you? I know that I'm not a second Super Bowl winning caliber quarterback Overall, I am never going to win a second Super Bowl in my career. That is basically what Aaron Rodgers said. Okay, that is what he told you. And LeBron James, you know, for all these guys in the media that love to say, oh, well, you know, he never gets enough help. You know, he's never had an elite coach, yada, yada, yada. Well, that is the way that LeBron James prefers it. It's almost overall like someone who prefers to be in a toxic relationship because they're too afraid to get in a healthy one because they truly know that deep down they're a piece of shit person. It's kind of the same thing with LeBron James. LeBron James prefers to overall be in basically situations where, you know, certain things may be a disadvantage to him. That way he can hide behind the excuses. Very similar to Aaron Rodgers. He shoot the ball. He's great moving without the basketball. Okay, so then who he attracts? Kevin Durant. Okay, then he goes along to win two championships with KD. And then all of a sudden, he have two down. Uh and playing off the ball when it comes down to it, if you notice about LeBron James or people like James Harden or Russell Westbrook, 
they don't play off the ball worth shit <laughs> because all those systems are basically the same. Uh, when it comes to LeBron James and James Harden and Russell Westbrook, they all might play a little bit different. James Harden is mainly overall going to try to shoot for threes, uh, go for layups, you know, or try to get a call. Russell Westbrook, he's going to rush towards the basket at 172 miles per hour and try to get a dunk or a layup. And if he can't get that, he's going to try to get lucky assists off the side. Uh, but he is going to mainly try to go for his triple doubles and his numbers. LeBron James, don't get me wrong, he does want to win, but he wants to win overall in his ball dominant system. And that is a big part of the reason why he has four wins in the finals. And two of them were pretty much miracles when it came down to it. And he has six losses. Don't get me wrong. Not every single one of those years was the talent comparable. But a lot of the times it was. Okay. So it is what it is. So LeBron James actually in terms of leading a team. And in terms of actually playing off the ball. And in terms of team intelligence. His team is usually going to be more at a disadvantage than what they are usually an advantage unless their team is just so greatly talented. Even against the Miami Heat a couple of years ago when it came down to it, that was not a team that should have took them six games, but it did. So it just is what it is because they are very well coached by Eric Spolstra. You know, and that was not even a team that really even had a 100% confirmed a great player. Maybe Jimmy Butler if you want to say that, but I'm not really even sure about him. So it just is what it is. But playing off the ball... Is not only overall, you know, moving around on the court like what Stephen Curry does, but LeBron James, he just does not move off the ball whatsoever. Uh, basically, when you see him get rid of the ball, he's usually going to be standing in one place, and that makes the team that much more one-dimensional. Because if you don't move around the courts, and if you don't have certain plays set up, a multitude of plays set up when it comes down to it, and a multitude of game plans, is going to make your team, and it's going to make your game plan that much more one-dimensional. And that's why so many intelligent teams... Not only with LeBron James, but James Harden and Russell Westbrook, and sometimes Luka Doncic as well, because he can be a little bit of a ball dominator as well. That's why a lot of teams have been able to figure those teams out, because you basically know what they're going to do. You know, when it comes to the Golden State Warriors, there are plays set up for everybody. Not just Stephen Curry, but Klay Thompson, Draymond Green, Andrew Wiggins. Andrew Wiggins was an all-star caliber player this year. If he would have been on almost any other team, I'm not sure if he would have been an all-star caliber player. And what you notice about Andrew Wiggins is that not only did he improve offensively, he improved defensively. So that is something that Stephen Curry truly should get praised for because the teammates that actually get on his team, he actually affects them in a positive way. Certain players overall, like a LeBron James, he makes your all-around team greater because of what he personally can bring to the table. But does he make overall individuals better? No, he does not. It just is what it is. Years because Clay Thompson is hurt, he's injured. You know, they're going through some rough times, or whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden, they acquire Andrew Wiggins, who is the who was the number one pick, who some was calling a bust. And all of a sudden, you plug, I agree, sir. And that's a great point. Uh, basically, any player that joins Stephen Curry, besides the exception of maybe D'Angelo Russell, uh, basically, every other player that's been able to play with Stephen Curry. The media or certain people always said, wow, look at look at how talented that team is, even though there may be certain players that really, at least on the surface, and they may not seem all that talented. But what great players and what great teams do is that they know how to bring out the best in every individual. Uh, and that is not something that everyone can do. Stephen Curry is a person that can do that. He is a player that can do that because he has the team intelligence. All in all, and of course, he has the great individual talent. And let me also talk a little bit more about this LeBron James system thing when it comes down to it, because a lot of people still may not understand how dominating the ball affects it a little bit negatively uh, or majorly negatively at times, because I've talked with certain friends who are LeBron James fans and they say, oh, well, LeBron James needs to dominate the ball to for them to win. No, that's not necessarily true. In order for Michael Jordan and for the Chicago Bulls to win the championships and finally get past the teams that they needed to get past, Michael Jordan had to sacrifice. He had to go from 38 or 37 points per game all the way down to about 29 or 31 points per game. And he could not get as, as many assists or as many rebounds anymore. Because when you're a team that is a cohesive unit and everyone is supposed to have a role, not just one player is supposed to be the leader in every single category. Because what that means is that basically <laughs> that not only are you taking another person's job when it comes down to it, but that basically you're stat chasing. And LeBron James knows that because when you have a cohesive unit, you're not worried about getting every single leading stat on the team because a team overall basically has to have a single role. And LeBron James 
overall does not like that. He likes to be the leader in rebounds and assists and points per game. That way, even if they lose when it comes down and so he can hide the fact that he does not play off the ball very well, he can say, well, what more did you expect me to do? I did all of this, 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 and this when it comes down to it. Like I said, very similar to an Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers will not throw the football down the field sometimes. Sure, he will not throw an interception, but a lot of the times in NFC championships, he also won't throw a touchdown either. <laughs> As we just seen overall against the San Francisco 49ers and in the last moments of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers the year before that. But, you know, Aaron Rodgers fans will take a look at his stats and say, oh, well, you know, you can't really get after him that much because he didn't have any interceptions. Yeah, but in the last moments, he also had no touchdowns. My point being with LeBron James is this. When you talk about people who dominate the basketball, when someone has the ball in their hands the majority of the time, that is not very good for the team because it makes things a lot more confusing for the team. They don't really have actual plays ran for them. Basically, the plays that are ran for them is that when you get the ball, basically do with the ball whatever that you can do, and you better make that damn shot. When you talk about teams like the Golden State Warriors, or when you talk about championship caliber teams, they actually have things planned in advance. They have plays, they have screens run for them, they have certain things, certain plays, certain things overall that are overall pretty much meant for certain players. So overall, that's why they're always usually going to think that when LeBron James or, or, or a Russell Westbrook is on a team, Basically, they say, listen, the ball is mine. I'm going to overall try to get my numbers. And whenever I need you overall to basically get certain shots, you better make it. And what that means is that the team is a hell of a lot more stressed. And overall, they're not as cohesive as they could be. Because when you do get the ball, which you never know when that is going to be. So that already makes you a hell of a lot more stressed. You may miss a shot or you may not do what you need to do. Because, you know, pretty much everything is going to be at random. And listen, there's going to be certain things at random, but you do need to have a good game plan. You may even need to have a few good game plans. And when you talk about LeBron James and his teams, they don't have a plan B or C or D. They have a plan A. And basically, that plan A is that I'm going to have the ball the majority of the time when it comes down to it. And if I can't get a layup, if I can't get in the zone, I'm going to pass it to you and you better make that damn shot. And that's why certain certain teams like that of the San Antonio Spurs or that of the Golden State Warriors usually blew LeBron James's teams out because the team does not have actual plays ran for them. It makes them a lot more nervous. And overall, it does not make them as proficient. You know, you're much more proficient as a team when you know already what's kind of going on and you have a good blend together, a cohesive unit. And overall, you already have a plan. So anyway replacing you get Andrew Wiggins and I be damned Steph Curry won the championship with him so when I look at it and I hear guys like LeBron James sitting up here saying things to hey man you know what if it's one guy outside of my son that I would love to play with it would actually be Steph Curry I would love to play with him why because he makes everyone around him better not with the pass just the way he plays forget that he's the greatest shooter of all time forget that he's one of the most skilled players to ever play the game forget that he's the best screen setter as a small guy that ever played the game of basketball forget all that I'm talking about when you put guys on the team with Steph Curry, he elevates their career and makes them better. This is no knock on Draymond Green, a former defensive player of the year. When he brings on the defensive side of things, he changed the game forever. But I will tell you this, if Draymond Green wasn't on the team with Steph Curry, I don't know if he had the career or all the accolades that he have without being on the team with Steph. Being on the team was... I would somewhat agree with you. Uh, now, what I will say is this. Do I think that it's been a little bit of a partnership? Do I think all in all that Clay Thompson and Draymond Green and Steve Kerr have, of course, helped Stephen Curry a lot, just as just has, uh, Stephen Curry has helped them? Yes, of course. Uh, but that's what all-time great players, that's overall what all-time great athletes do. So many people today, especially, they love to take a look at a Tom Brady or... They love to take a look at a Michael Jordan and they love to say, well, yeah, of course, you know, that person is so great and they have so many championships because, you know, overall, take a look at the coaching they had or take a look at this, take a look at that. Yes, but so many players and certain athletes, they're not willing to actually humble themselves overall to get to a better level of understanding because so many people are either too damn stubborn or they want to do it their way. A Russell Westbrook, for example, he's a little bit more lenient now, <laughs> but he's never going to be a championship caliber player. 
Russell Westbrook, at the end of the day, he cares about his stats, you know, basically overall, and he is never overall going to be a proficient enough player. But now that he's basically willing to do whatever the hell the team wants, his real flaws are pretty much exposed. Because when you usually have ball dominators that play off the ball like that, they don't usually look that good. And they know that. That's why James Harden and Russell Westbrook, when you see them overall as the second or third option on a team, they look like absolute shit when it came down. And that's why LeBron James didn't look that good in the 2011 finals either. Because for a time, he was looked at as somewhat of the second option in that team. And when he was the second option, he didn't know what to do with himself. And, uh, and as a player... You sometimes need to know overall when to be the first option and also sometimes when, you know, to back down, when to be the second option. And people like LeBron James and Russell Westbrook, they don't know how to do that because if they don't have the ball in their hand constantly and have enough chances, they're not going to be as proficient as what they need to be. Or at least players like a James Harden and a Russell Westbrook. LeBron James, I think, is very highly proficient. But at this point in time, when it comes down to it, he just needs those numbers because he knows that more than likely he's not going to get any more championships than what he has right now. So he needs to hide behind his stats to be in the GOAT conversation. He makes guys better. And when you hear one of the guys, the greatest of all time in LeBron James, that comes out and says that I want to or I want to play with that dude or I would like to play with that dude, that speaks volumes. Well, if you're going to go with the argument there, Kendrick, about make guys better, uh, how many guys did Russell make better with the Celtics? Never won before he got there, and then he won 11 of 13 when he did get there. Changed the game, and he yes. changed the game. I would agree with that. Now, of course, a lot of people would debate, well, when Bill Russell was in the league, there was only about eight or ten teams. I really can't remember how many teams. And that is a good point when it comes down to it. But at the end of the day, Bill Russell, he was very highly accomplished. He was a great defensive player. He was very, very valuable. He won five MVPs, I believe, or somewhere around four or five, somewhere around there. Uh, he won 11 NBA championships. Maybe if you want to not put as much emphasis on them because it was an era during eight teams, you can argue that. But the thing is this, even though, yes, the Celtics did debatably have the most stacked team, you know, around that time, or at least one of the more stacked teams when it came down, to it, it still was a generation with a lot of talent. And they were not winning consistently without him. I don't believe that they won much or won anything before he got there. And when he left, it took a while overall for John Havlicek, I believe, to lead them to success. So anyway. They had three teams in the league then. No, oh, come man. on, stop oh, with that. You know what? It. And it made stop. it better because everybody, because the players were good. The less teams, the better the league because you don't have a watered-down product with 30 teams and half the guys don't know how to play. That makes the league better. Well, I would somewhat understand Mr. Mad Dog Russo's point. Sometimes overall, you know, a greater amount does not always make it better. Uh, but I'm not sure <laughs> if I would overall, you know, basically allege, if you're trying to allege that every single team had an even chance. But listen, what I'll say is this. Bill Russell, in my view, was the best player for that era. Out of Jerry West, Will Chamberlain, Oscar Robertson, uh, Bob Pettit, you know, Bob Cousy, you know, John Havlicek, whoever the hell else you want to include. Uh, when it comes down to, and I'm sure, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, of course, that was in his earlier days, but, you know, I, I believe anyway, but Bill Russell was the best of that era, okay? So, anyway. And if you're going to go by champ, but if you're going to go by champ, hold on now, if you're going to go by championships, how many Hall of Famers are on the Celtics? One, Tatum. How many Hall of Famers are on... Well, right, man, Doug Russo, but let's not go with that point. I don't really like to use that point, and that's a point that I usually like to call the LeBron James fanboy argument because they always love to use that when it comes to Michael Jordan. They always use that when it comes to the teams that he faced in the finals. Well, how many Hall of Famers did Michael Jordan face? Right, but just because a team does not always have first ballot Hall of Famers on it does not mean that they were not a greatly talented team. Uh, if we were to take a look at Tom Brady, for example, uh, and if we were to take a look at the Seattle Seahawks, you know, now, of course, football is a little bit different than basketball. You can make the Hall of Fame a hell of a lot more easier, especially these days overall than what than what you could the NFL. But we could take a look at it overall. We could say, oh, well, you know, but, you know, uh, Bam Bam Cam Chancellor is not, you know, overall a Hall of Famer. You know, overall, that defense was overrated. You know, Richard Sherman may not even, you know, be a possible Hall of Famer, even though he might make it. Uh, Marshawn Lynch, some would even debate, is not a Hall of Famer. The only first ballot Hall of Famer, in my opinion, that really was on that team is really Russell Wilson, you know. But when it comes down to it, that team was still an all-time great team. 
not necessarily because they just had pure Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer, but because they were all greatly talented unit as a cohesive unit. And it's the same thing with Michael Jordan in the 90s. People would take a look at the Seattle Supersonics, for example, and they'll say, oh, well, that team was so weak. Who did they have on there? Well, if you take a look at the statistics and if you take a look overall at what they were able to do, not only were they able to win 60 plus games, but that was a team that had Gary Payton on there, who is a first ballot Hall of Famer. They had Sean Kemp, who is a Hall of Famer, I believe, as well. They also had Hershey Hawkins, who was averaging double figures that season. They had Sean Kemp, or excuse me, not Sean Kemp, Sam Perkins, who I believe, who was a decent point guard back in the day. I believe he was a point guard. If I'm wrong about that, then someone correct me. But he was averaging double figures. And then I believe they had Dead Left Shrimp, who overall was averaging 17 points per game and was a three-time All-Star. You know, so let's not... Let's not always go by that argument, please, okay? Because when we take a look at that Boston Celtics team, you know, sure, if we were going to debate a Hall of Famer, yes, Tatum is the only Hall of Famer there. But let's not sit here and pretend that Jalen Brown and Marcus Smart and Al Horford were not all-star level caliber players and overall that they were not a very greatly coached, good, cohesive, and very talented unit. Going into that series, that was looked at as a series that could go either way. So Mad Dog, let's not use that narrative, please. Dallas. Because in my opinion, that is a very weak argument. One. Donkic. He beat them. Magic. When he, and you don't got him on the Mount Rush, well, this is magic. Forget Bird. This is magic. Ma who made everybody better and revolutionaries, revolutionized the game. Magic Johnson is on my Mount Rushmore. Uh, in my opinion, uh, Magic Johnson, LeBron James, Larry Bird, uh, they're kind of all within that same unit. But I would say that Magic Johnson, in my view, gets a slight edge over all those players. In my view, Larry Bird, Tim Duncan, and LeBron James, because of their accomplishments, their championships, and their accolades and their value that they brought to the game, in my opinion, all those players are in the same category. And certain people especially may not agree with Tim Duncan. Uh, I think Tim Duncan is debatably, not even debatably, he is the most underrated uh, top 10 player of all time. You know, so many people take a look at Tim Duncan and they're like, oh, well, he had Greg Popovich. Yeah, he had Greg Popovich, but please tell me how many championships that Greg Popovich has won or even how many finals he's been to without Tim Duncan. He's been to zero NBA finals. And if you take a look oh, without Tim Duncan, that is. And if you take a look overall at some of those teams that Tim Duncan overall led to the NBA finals or led to a very great playoff record, you're talking about a player that made the playoffs every single year. All right, not even not even certain players like a Kobe Bryant or a LeBron James was able to do that. Okay, Tim Duncan was able to lead them to the playoffs every year. Even certain times where there was no more than two players, I believe, on the team averaging double figures. All right, so Tim Duncan is one of the most impactful and one of the most underrated players in NBA history. And if you were to also take a look, I believe, at some of the greatest playoff performers of all time, According to, I believe, all the statistics, Tim Duncan has the third greatest playoff performance in NBA history, at least of that of the past 20 plus years. So Tim Duncan, a lot of people are not going to agree that in my view or that, you know, that, that, that he is in the same conversation as LeBron James and Larry Bird. In my opinion, he absolutely deserves to be there. You're talking about a player that went to a franchise. Yes, there was a great coach, but that Spurs squad never won an NBA championship before Tim Duncan got there, and they still to this day have never won one when he left and retired, okay? On top of that, he's won five NBA championships, two MVPs, three finals MVPs when it comes down to it, and he is the great big fundamental. So Tim Duncan, in my view, deserves a lot more credit than what he usually gets. And in terms of the all-time great list, he does, in my view, have to be above Shaq. He has to be above Will Chamberlain. He has to overall be above Akeem Olajuwon, Kobe Bryant, and at the moment, Stephen Curry. And not everyone is going to agree with that. Now, do I believe from a dominant and from a talent perspective that Shaq and Will Chamberlain and Akeem Olajuwon were above Tim Duncan? Yes, but at, at, at a certain moment in time, we have to take a look at consistency overall and impact and overall what they were able to do in terms of winning. I'm sorry, but Will Chamberlain, who only has two NBA championships, I can't debate him over Tim Duncan. Not in my view. Shaq overall, maybe, because he has four NBA championships. But not only does Tim Duncan have the same amount of finals MVPs as Shaquille O'Neal when it comes down to it, he has one more NBA championship than him. And on top of that, he has more regular season MVPs. So Tim Duncan, all in all, uh, when it comes down to it, yes, in my opinion, he's over Shaq. He's also over Kobe. He's over Stephen Curry, in my opinion. He's also over Akeem Olajuwon. I've heard arguments for 
Tim Duncan being below Hakeem Olajuwon. No, I'm sorry. I cannot agree with that. Hakeem Olajuwon has less MVPs, less finals appearances, less finals MVPs, okay, uh, and less championships. There really is no debate other than skill, in my opinion, that Hakeem Olajuwon is over Tim Duncan. Sorry. Just is what it is. Because Magic could dominate. And some people overall would not, you know, uh, like it that I have Magic Johnson over LeBron James or that I have Larry Bird and LeBron James in the same category. When you talk about both Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, not only could they play in a multitude of systems and play probably a certain amount of positions, when you compare their offensive skill sets, in my view, uh, if you know the game of basketball, both Magic Johnson and Larry Bird were probably all around more offensively skilled than what a LeBron James was. Uh, you know, scoring-wise, they were pretty much right there with LeBron James. When it comes down to it, passing-wise, Magic Johnson certainly was the better passer. I would also debate that Larry Bird was the more talented passer, all right, when it came down to it. Now, of course, certain people would say, well, Larry Bird didn't average as many assists. Yes, because he didn't have the ball in his hands like what a LeBron James does. So it just is what it is. So he's not going to average the stats of what a LeBron James does. Larry Bird certainly was a better shooter all around than LeBron James. He made the 50-40-90 club twice in his career. When you talk about rebounding, he certainly is a better rebounder than LeBron James, both Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, I believe. And when you talk about shooting ability, they're probably both above LeBron James, in my opinion. So when it comes down to it, yes, both Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, they're both right there. In my opinion, Magic Johnson... Uh, when it comes down to Larry Bird, when you talk about their accomplishments, they're all three right there in that same category. The difference is, is that LeBron James, it's basically taken him 18 years to get four NBA championships. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson were able to complete what they did in only 13 years, and even a little bit less than that because of certain injuries, and of course, Magic Johnson with the HIV situation. But anyway. Game scoring four points. Magic did not have to put the ball in the basket to dominate a game. He can get 20 rebounds and 15 assists and score one basket. That's very true. And that's overall what all-time great players do. Uh, and listen, don't get me wrong. Uh, LeBron James, you know, uh, you know, or Kobe Bryant sometimes, with them not putting the ball in the basket, they still could somewhat, you know, get a game going. But probably not the way that a Magic Johnson or Larry Bird could, in my opinion. Stephen Curry, in my view, even though I would not put him above LeBron James, in terms of making a more cohesive unit, when it comes down to it, Stephen Curry is more like Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, really, than what a LeBron James is, in my view. Anyway. And he'd be the star of the game. When Magic won the 84, 85 championship, he'd be Bird, Parrish, McHale, and Dennis Johnson. Those are four Hall of Famers. There's only one. Right, that's great, Matt Del Grusso. But once again, let's be real. That Boston Celtics team that Stephen Curry faced off with they were a real contender. They are very well coached. They had a great amount of talent. Okay, so let's let's cut the bullshit. Okay, they were able to get past Giannis Antetokounmpo, who was the former NBA champion of the last season before this season. Now, of course, they did not have Chris Middleton, but still the Boston Celtics were able to get past them. And that was not easy, considering overall that the Boston Celtics, I believe, had lost two of the last couple of series. Or maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe, maybe they only lost one to, to Milwaukee. I can't remember. But they also had to go up overall, I believe, against Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. And they swept them overall in the first round with the Brooklyn Nets. Okay, they swept them. So they had to get through them. And then on top of that, they had to get through the Miami Heat, who, you know, once again, in my view, they don't really have a definitive A-grade player on there. But they were the former Eastern Conference champions. They just made the finals a few years ago. So <laughs> that team, that Boston Celtics team, was pretty much the biggest threat that it could have been to that of the Boston Celtics. And overall, they, Stephen Curry was able to lead them past there. And that's with Klay Thompson being about 65 to 70% of what he was a few years ago. Now with that ACL and Achilles tear and Draymond Green pretty much being a fucking idiot for three out of those six games. Anyway. And I, and I love Curry. I mean, I hate to even do this, but I got to say something about putting four. And everybody kills me. Well, you know what? Ten is not bad. I mean, we're not putting him 50. We're putting him 10, 11, 12. But you can't put him over Magic. You can't put him over Russell on the Mount Rushmore. It's not fair. You can't. I, I would agree with that. And my Mount Rushmore looks like Michael Jordan, probably Kareem with Jabbar, then Bill Russell. Then I would probably have Magic Johnson. Then after that, in my opinion, is pretty much a toss-up between LeBron James, Tim Duncan, and Larry Bird. 
I probably would have LeBron James at number five just because of what he has accomplished. But when it comes down, and in my opinion, it's very close. Not everyone is going to agree with that, but it just is what it is. Uh, and then afterwards, who would I have after that? Shaq and Will Chamberlain, in my view, they're pretty much in the same category. So then that would take up number eight and number nine. And then that basically leaves number 10. And in my opinion, these three players are at the same table arguing for number 10. Stephen Curry, Kobe Bryant, and Akeem Olajuwon. And there might be a few other players in that conversation as well. In my opinion, who holds that spot over the other two? I would probably have to give it to Stephen Curry at this point in time. And a lot of people would not agree with that. But in terms of an impact and value perspective, and on top of that, him having more MVPs than both of them. And in my view, you could debate that he should have more finals MVPs than what he does. And him always clearly being, in my view, the most impactful and most important player on every team that he was on. I would probably rank Stephen Curry number 10, but I wouldn't rank him any higher than that. Not when he beat a Celtics well, team that has one Hall of Famer on it. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube for live streaming sports and premium content. Subscribe. But anyways, that's really about it for today. I just thought that I would talk about that because I thought that would be a very particularly interesting conversation. And I thought that I would put overall my opinion to the task about what I truly believe about this conversation. But that's really about it for today. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll talk to you all later. Uh, to ESPN Plus.